Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock and welcome to what we all hope will be the last virtual meeting for the Place and Resources Overview Committee. Um, I'm just going to do a quick roll call of the committee members that are present today. Um, if everybody could keep their cameras and uh, microphones off, uh, muted until you're invited to speak, that would be great. So our members of the committee today are uh, Councillor Les Fry, who is our vice chairman, present. Morning, everybody. I'm here. Morning. Councillor Pauline Batstone. Good morning, Carol. Morning. Councillor Tony Coombs. Morning, Chairman. Morning. Uh, Councillor Ryan Hope, I don't believe, is with us. Uh, Councillor Sherry Jesperson. Morning, Chair, present. Morning. Uh, Councillor Val Pothacre. Good morning, Chairman, present. Morning. Councillor Maria Rowe. Uh, good morning, present. Morning. Uh, Councillor Andrew Starr. Good morning, everyone, present. Councillor Roland Tarr. Good morning, everyone, present. Thank you. Um, we also have officers attending for the overall agenda and they are John Selgren, who is our Executive Director of Place, Jonathan Mayer, Corporate Director, Legal and Democratic and Monitoring Officer, Lindsay Watson, our Senior Democratic Services Officer, and Lillian Broad and Isla Mitchell, our, our producers for the meeting. And I do think that makes us sound like a Radio 4 programme. Um, we'll introduce other officers as we go to each agenda item. Um, the statement, I need to make a statement as it's a virtual meeting. In the light of the situation with COVID-19 case rates, Dorset Council's Chief Executive Matt Prosser has exercised his delegated powers to continue to hold virtual informal committee meetings. Where a decision is required, committee members will express a minded to decision in respect of recommendations set out in officer reports with decisions being taken under officer delegated authority in light of minded to decisions expressed by members in the virtual meetings. Any decisions or recommendations required will be confirmed by the, by the appropriate officer at the conclusion of the committee's debate on an agenda item. And if we could just remember to use the chat bar for RTS, that would be lovely. Right, item number one, apologies. Chairman, we've got apologies from Councillor Ryan Hope. Thank you. Uh, item two, declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations of interest? Uh, Chair, uh, Councillor Starr, I, I don't know whether I should declare a declaration of interest due to the um, the blue badge scheme that's coming up, but uh, my wife is a, a blue badge holder. I don't know okay. whether that will in, 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 uh, interfere at all. I wouldn't have thought that would, but would Jonathan just confirm? Chairman, I think it's per perfectly appropriate for Councillor Starr to, re to, re to remain and participate in that item. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Right, Chairman's, Chairman's update. Here we go. Um, I would like our committee to work in the way that after we have heard an officer report, I will invite the portfolio holder to speak if they wish to do so and are present. And we then open the questions and discussions uh, from the members of this committee first. Once all members have spoken, I'll then open it to non-members to come in before coming back to committee members to deal with the recommendations. I would like to avoid, please, repetition of points. So please, by all means, come in on any area you still need clarification on or to make a new point or indeed to ask a new question. But please avoiding, avoid repeating anything that's been discussed fully. Uh, now, members will know of the library consultation that has been taking place. An overview committee task and finish group will be formed to review the results of the consultation and to help with the formation of a new strategy for future of the libraries. It's been decided that both people and health and place and resources overview committees will come together as it affects both areas and nominations are currently being sought from group leaders. There'll be a total committee number of 10 and meetings will take place in April and May. And so ended the chairman's update. Right, we move now to item four, which is Chair, the public. Chair, Chair, you've got an RTS from Councillor David Taylor. Uh, I don't... Do we, re David, do you really need to come in at this point? Can we just move on? No, no, it's fine. I just wanted to know if I could RTS when it's relevant at the end. Is that OK? Yes, yeah. Um, 
Councillor Les Fry is dealing with all who's going to speak first, second, third, etc. So Les will keep on top of that. Thank you okay, very much. We, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. We, move, we move to item four, the public participation. Now we've got two questions from Mike Carhart Harris, and these questions will be read out by uh, Lindsay Watson. OK, so um, the questions are, as a Wimborne resident and member of a group, Wimborne Athletic Club, that uses QE Leisure Centre, I'm deeply concerned about the recommendation that Dorset Council withdraws from the management of the centre. This would put well-used services for the school, community, clubs and vulnerable groups at grave risk of loss. This includes QE's swimming pool, crucial for giving children vital life skills of swimming and water safety. I would like to submit the following two questions addressed to Councillor Laura Miller at the Place and Resources Overview Committee on Thursday the 10th of February. Question one. It is fair to ask whether the subsidy to QE Leisure Centre of £550,000 a year, a third of the Council's leisure budget, represents value for money. However, it is not fair that the community of Wimborne and QE School could potentially lose vital health, fitness and sports services because of an historic funding anomaly rather than any proven lack of need or viability. As it is not clear from the report, can the Council explain why the funding arrangement for QELC was allowed to become so disproportionate in comparison with Dorset's seven other leisure centres? And question two. Many Dorset leisure centres are managed in partnership with commercial leisure operators or social enterprises or are wholly community owned while continuing to be subsidised. However, the option for QE School to explore such an alternative operating model, which could ensure the continued availability of its existing facilities, is given little consideration as this would require ongoing subsidy. Rather than withdraw its funding from QELC entirely, why can the council not develop a more equitable distribution of subsidies that would enable all eight existing leisure centres to continue to provide services to their communities? Chairman, that's the end of the question. Thank you very much. We're going to have a response from the portfolio holder, Councillor Laura Miller. Thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you very much also to Mr. Carhart Harris for his questions. So prior to uh, local government reorganisation in 2019, um, all the funding allocated to leisure facilities was determined by each of the predecessor councils. So I do understand the concerns raised um, and we are going to continue to support the school in, a in, in identifying ways to maximise the use of their facilities for both pupils and for the community. We do have to note that there are seven other public leisure facilities within a 20 minute drive time of QELC, um, as well as several large private and budget leisure clubs that also continue to serve Wimborne area communities well. And this is really different to other parts of Dorset Council area where the health and sport and fitness facilities are far more dispersed and difficult to access. So this relatively high level of choice for local residents in the Wimborne area and the competition against the QE facilities have unfortunately had a detrimental impact on the usage numbers and income at a time when operating costs have continued to rise. But um, our, our leisure review looked at several different operating models, um, all of which would still require significant ongoing investment for the council. Um, we will continue to talk to the school. We will support them in exploring all opportunities available to them. Um, and the recommendations in the report today will, I think, support a more equitable distribution of leisure funds across Dorset. Um, and it will also enable Dorset Council to be able to target the areas that are really most in need. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. We have a statement from Ross Bowell. He's from the Wimborne Academy Trust. Now, we could have simply noted it, but I think that let's keep this all out in the open and we want everybody to know we've listened and, and everybody understands the, the feelings behind this. So this will be read by Lindsay Watson. OK, Chairman, the statement is. Dorset Council's predecessor councils have operated joint use leisure facilities at Queen Elizabeth School since 1974 and the current dual use agreement runs until 2086. 
The school and trust strong preference is that Dorset Council accepts the views of the overwhelming majority of respondents to the public consultation and retains the joint use arrangements for the benefit of the local community and the current and future pupils of the school. Withdrawing from the agreement early may realise a saving for the council's place budget, but it also has a direct cost of £279,500 per year of central government funding, which will be removed from the dedicated schools grant, see section 15. However, as the council seems determined to proceed, it must leave the school with a suitable facility. This was recognised by the corporate director of place in a meeting with the school and trust on 7th of January 2021. Dorset Council understands that there will be an upfront cost to reprovide at a reasonable standard. The revenue savings would offset this. The exit proposals and capital sums set out in this paper are wholly inadequate to meet this commitment. The Council and its predecessors have been the managers and majority users of QELC over nearly 50 years and have under invested in maintenance and renewal. Many building services are original, dating back to the 1970s and 80s, are hugely inefficient and are long overdue for replacement. This is set out in detail in the April 2019 Dorset Property Condition Survey, quoted in this paper, where the Council's own surveyors identified capital expenditure required of £1,165,720 to 2023-2024 and a further £714,050 in 2024-2025. An independent survey would likely find the cost to be greater still. The paper as presented makes a virtue of opportunistically exploiting a contractual loophole to walk away from an arrangement made for community benefit that has lasted for almost 50 years and is due to run for over 60 more and knowingly transferring existing liabilities away from the council onto the school, ultimately to the detriment of the education of pupils in Wimborne and East Dorset. The council should commission an independent condition survey, remodelling design and life cycle costing services to properly establish the works required to reprovide at a reasonable standard for the school and commit to funding the capital cost of these works. The costs will be a small proportion of the value of the place budget revenue savings over the medium term and will allow the council to show that it is at least acting properly. That is the end of the statement, Chairman. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, there's a response now from the portfolio holder, Laura Miller again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So thank you to Mr Bell for his statement. Um, just a couple of comments, really. So the prior to the condition survey in 2019, property surveyors representing the council and the school have done an annual uh, building review. Um, and recommended a schedule of prioritised maintenance works to be completed over the following three years. Um, the schedule has always been agreed by both the council and the school, with the school contributing 40% of the costs and the council funding the remaining 60%. Um, on the agreement, the dual use agreement does have a clearly defined clause within it that allows the council to withdraw from the management agreement at any time. Uh, providing that it gives two years notice uh, that that agreement was agreed and signed by all parties um, and actually in the report it's highlighted that the council is committed to meeting our contractual obligations prior to any withdrawal uh, but we're also recommending further investment in the all-weather pitch so we'll carry on positively engaging with the school during the transitional period um, any concerns that are raised uh, will, will form part of the ongoing discussions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. We move on to item number five, which is questions from members. And I don't believe we have any, do we? No, need? Chairman, just to confirm we didn't receive any questions from okay. councillors. Thank you. OK, we move to item number six, which is the Dorset Highways Asset Management Plan. And I believe Jack Wilshire is going to present or was due to, but he's not there and I can see the lovely Matt Piles instead. Matt, are you presenting? So good morning, Chair. So unfortunately, Jack is uh, ill today. So I'm here uh, to present the paper, but I also have some colleagues in the background when the detailed questions come up from committee members. Thank you. So 
So if I may, Chair, um, the paper in front of you is our asset management policy and strategy document that sits above our highly asset management plan. And it's really important because this is a key strategic document that is required. Why? Department of Transport funds uh, Dorset Council in, in responsibility roads. But this is how we manage our assets, which is probably the biggest asset that we have within Dorset Council, our roads, our pavements, etc, etc. And the reason why it's important, it provides length and certainty of funding. It's how we look at the future and what we need to do. And this is member led, if I may chair. We need overview, scrutiny and the cabinet to actually agree to the asset management plan. And the reason is there's a danger that we could actually lose finances if we don't provide a good asset management plan. And DFT recognise that Dorset Council's asset plan is good. We're not here to ask for extra money, which is unusual sometimes when we come to meetings. This is about clarification of what the plan is. And we are lucky uh, and grateful that the capital top up that is going to the budget discussion of £6.7 million per year uh, will allow us to actually put in place our plan for the next five years. This sits above the highway asset management plan and demonstrates how we link our corporate priorities as well, which is very important. Um, so within the plan, we look at every asset. Um, so we look at roads, cycleways, bridges, safety fences, drainage, signing, lining, and we make sure and we look at the different scenarios of how we spend and then agree the scenarios for the future. The problem is, and I do recognise, we are holding the line on carriageway condition. And that's really important. Some other parts of the assets need to drop back and we do recognise that members are concerned about things like signage and lines. But what's next for us is that we need this policy to be agreed so that we can actually deliver against the HAMP and make sure that we go forward and talk to DFT about potential funding for the future. Um, because there is a risk that if the asset management plan is not in a good condition, that we could actually lose funding for the future. I will probably leave it there, Chair, for questions from the committee, but I know colleagues are here if there's any detailed questions about the plan itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just ask, would the portfolio holder like to come in at this moment, uh, Councillor Ray Bryan? Yes, good morning, everybody. I'm Councillor Ray Bryan, portfolio holder for highways, travel and the environment. Um, uh, Matt has once again very capably uh, outlined uh, what the proposal is in front of you. Um, I would add that people underestimate um, the work that has to go in to maintaining the highway network in the condition that it is. Matt has highlighted the fact that we're having to concentrate on the main routes which means some of the smaller routes um, are facing uh, challenges. Those challenges we will deal with over a period of time, but we are so dependent on the DFT uh, to support us that uh, this plan allows us to continue to ask D DFT for support. And I think it's, uh, it's very, very important. I've been a party to this report being put together and we faced a number of challenges. I would ask members to, uh, uh, to at times when they go outside the area, look at the condition of neighbouring roads and then come back and look at our condition. And I think you'll find we show uh, a very favourable um, uh, sort of image as far as our, our main highways are concerned. I do acknowledge that we've got work to do on some of the smaller roads and we are working very hard to find a way in which we can address that. Um, and that's all I'll say at this stage. I may have some questions I'll need to answer later on. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Fry, who, who, who Chair, should we go first? Chair, it's um, Councillor Pauline Batstone first. OK, Councillor Batstone. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I want to welcome the plan because as a councillor with a rural ward um, that where, high, where roads are an ongoing problem and, and our communications are so vital. Over the years, we've not had such a, a clear and good plan. It's actually readable. So thank you very much to Jack and his team for an excellent plan. And that's all I want to say, Chairman. Thank you. Chair, next Councillor Maria Rowe. Councillor Rowe, come in, please. 
Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I, I agree. It's an it's an excellent, um, very comprehensive uh, plan. My question is um, at page 17, bridges and structures. It's concerning to learn about the decline in bridge conditions with deterioration happening more quickly than you're able to maintain the bridge stock. I'm certainly no expert, but 641,000 investment seems that there will be further deterioration and it will mean that we're kicking the problems down the road and the bridges will be more expensive to fix in future years. We surely cannot risk a catastrophic incident happening and surely we should be urgently requesting more money from the Department of Transport. So if, if I might chair, uh, Please I do. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. It's a very poignant one. Um, I think the most important thing is that our bridge teams make sure that our structures are safe. And they are inspected. Um, when we have significant capital investment, we actually come through what we call the capital uh, asset management uh, group and we will put individual bids for additional bridge funding if it's not within our current DFT funding streams. I think we all recognise and there's highway authorities across the country, there's a great deal of pressure on the funding that we receive. Hence why this document is so important because we look at a five, you know, a continuous plan and we make sure that where we spend our money is the priority of, of what we have. Uh, but I do take on board what you're saying, but to reassure you, we have a very robust safety inspection and our bridge team, and I will say this are probably one of the best in the country. And I'm very proud of them as you see the work that we do across Dorset, but I do take on board the points that you've raised. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Fry. Next, Councillor Sherry Jesperson, please. Thank, thank you. Come in, Sherry. Um, good morning, uh, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I also support this plan. Um, it's been very carefully considered by the uh, task and finish group of which I was a member. However, I've got a couple of comments that I feel I need to make just to get, well, one is the second one's a question, but the first one's more in the nature of a, a comment. Um, in section 6.7, we see the terrible phrase manage decline. Mm. Um, now, I don't ever want to see manage decline as our investment strategy for highways. We went there once before in the um, county council days and, and our highways team have, have now brought the highways back from the brink. And as I think the portfolio holder uh, did say, our roads by and large are in in better condition than they've been for a good while and and so we're we that work has paid off um but i think we need to just acknowledge that um issues with regard to roads road conditions road safety is the most often the the most frequent issue raised in the post bags of many, many members. It's really, really important to our um, ta council taxpayers. And I just want to put on record to say, I don't want ever for managed decline to ever again be our highway strategy. So I support this report. I understand what that phrase is doing in there, but I'm, I absolutely don't ever want to see us going back to the days when we salami sliced the highways budget um, because it was an easy one to cut because the consequences of some of that cutting in the past was was not cost saving and uh, not good value for money for our residents. So that that's just my statement. Can we please not ever again sacrifice the highways budget for other budgets that people think are more urgent? Um, my second one, which is more in the nature of a question chair, um, is that we focus very much as we go through this document on the assets we have. And I don't know where we would put anything about the assets we're going to buy in the future, if not in an asset management strategy. So could we at some point, perhaps next time we review this or, or make sure that we are thinking about um, the strategy that will 
um, firm up how we intend to manage future assets. I'm thinking here about street lighting, where we want to move towards low impact lighting to bring our street lighting policy more in line with our planning policy. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, road sign policy. So we're managing our assets. I, I don't know where I would see the policy that that supports um, removing street signs and having fewer street signs, not more, and also what we, how we take care and how we recycle the street signs that we have. Um, there's nothing in here about the assets that we, we might want to be making more um, climate friendly. So it uh, it's probably, it's too late to add this to th this report, but I would like to flag up that we need somewhere to be thinking about future assets and how our future assets might need managing in a different way. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if anyone wants to comment on either of those points. I shall open it up to Matt or, or indeed to Ray. Would either of you like to come in and comment? I'm going to let Matthew go first, but I would like to um, put uh, uh, Councillor Jesperson's mind at rest over the words managed decline. So, uh, so thank you, Chair, if I may, and thank you, Councillor Jesperson, uh, as ever. Um, I'll let Ray answer the managed decline question, but as the Director of Highways, I fully support what she is saying. Um, the second part, that really links to the local transport plan, if I may, Chair, the future of Dorset, and that's linked to our local plan, which is important as well. Um, Councillor Brown and myself are in discussions with the Department of Transport on various matters. But actually, how we get funding for the future and how Dorset is seen in infrastructure is probably extremely important in relation to the climate change and ecological agenda, uh, housing, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And we are making sure that the local transfer plan, and we will come back to overview at some point, Chair, with the future infrastructure strategy for Dorset Council. I hope that answers that question. Thank you. I think chairman's frozen. Yes, that 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 while the chair unfreezes. Yes, thank you very much. That did answer that question. Um, and I think Ray, you wanted to come in and, uh, and address my uh, impassioned statement for highways funding. <laughs> uh, I, I, I fully appreciate your passion on this. Let me tell you, I need every bit of support we can get. <clears throat> when I first read the report, I looked at those words and thought, mm, that's going to cause some interest, uh, but I decided not to take it out because I think it's imperative that people realise without continual funding, we will face that situation. Let me tell you, that's not going to happen on my watch and I will work with Matthew and the team to make sure we don't have any decline. And I think it's very important that uh, people outside of this council, in other words, the DFT, realize that without their continuing support at a sensible level we do face some consequences nationally so the reason the words are in there are because i wanted people to understand that it's something we face for the future but as i said that's not happening on my watch thank you chairman thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Brown. I, I will keep going until our chair rejoins the meeting. I think uh, the next person wishing to speak was Councillor David Taylor, please. Thank you, Chair. Although missing, and thank you, Les, and thank you, the team. There are several questions I wish to ask, if that's OK. Um, the first thing, I welcome the report. It is in depth and at long last we're looking at cycleways and pathways and byways, which is which is good news for us, uh, especially articles 3.12 to 3.17. Um, the fact is that you are going to invest in looking at our cycleways to actually improve what we're doing with the with, with our uh, environment, should we say, because it's a, a, a carbon free, <laughs> as, we say, as we say these days. Um, the second question is the railway bridge A37, um, the road is still giving us problems uh, towards uh, Charlton Down, Stratton and uh, Charminster with slipways. Um, also the cycleway of Bradford Pebble Junction uh, to, from the A37 is, uh, is a danger zone for cycleways regarding investment, looking at that. And also um, I went to do a talk in Portisham on uh, Friday, I think it was, and uh, the roads were just awful. 
And the thing is that it was, it was just like we couldn't see where we were going. There were no lines or anything. So the fact is that the mine roads are needed to be invested in. And um, I welcome anything to actually make make our county safer. That's the several questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do apologise, everybody. My orange light went on on my internet hub and it's just been a nightmare. I'm back. Um, who would like to come in? And it's, uh, 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 Chair, it's um, I think Matt or Councillor Bryant have responded okay. to Councillor David Taylor's question there, please. So, so if, if my Thank Chair, you. and I have empathy with you, Chair, because I'm hitting my internet recently as we speak because it's going on and off. Um, can I make a suggestion, Councillor Taylor, that actually we meet up and discuss the individual concerns that you've raised? Because Fantastic. this is more about the strategy of the Highway Authority going forward. Yeah. Um, I've taken board your support for sustainable cycleways. Thank you very much. But I'm going to make sure that we, we meet up and talk about the issues that you've raised, if that's OK. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Chair, Chair, no, Chair it, 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 go on, Ray. Yeah, sorry. Um, Chair, if I could just come in on one of uh, Councillor Taylor's points. Uh, he mentioned drainage. Um, it's, it's a real passion of mine, as you know, or everybody must know by now. Um, in the old Dorset County Council days, we made cuts to the way we did things, and that has had a tremendous ongoing effect. Um, Matt's not going to forgive me for this. Um, he is now putting together a, a an action plan <clears throat> as to how we deal with the verges, the drainage, etc., because it falls into different departments, and yeah. I'm passionate that we get it all under one control. So I thank you for raising the point and hopefully that answers your question. It is being looked at and as I say, Matt and I have had a number of discussions on this uh, and it's progressing quite well. Thank you. Can I thank come back? Thank you very much. Can I Sorry, come back? Did you, did you want to come back? Yeah, David? just to say that Ray has actually raised the very important point about the communications and committing the teams together. Yeah, it seems to be a bit uh, distanced at the moment and uh, I speak to relevant departments regarding cycleways and things and it's, it's they're doing bits and pieces all over the show and it's joining up which is what we need and Matt I agree with you completely I know where you're going and I will have that meeting with you thank you thank you very much does anybody else wish to speak on this Chair. item okay, that, okay the next person to speak is Councillor Tony Coombs right, thank you Councillor Coombs Good morning, Chairman. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, first of all, can I thank uh, Councillor O'Brien for answering half of my questions in his previous response? <laughs> Take the wind right out of my sails. Um, I was going to try and give you a good segue into talking about gully emptying and grip, cut grip cutting, but there we go, you've already got there. Um, Sherry Jesperson also mentioned previous uh, Dorset County policy about managed decline. I remember that meeting full well when we agreed that policy and it was always something that would only could only ever be a short term policy. You can I remember reading a story once where it said for the ballet dancer, if you didn't practice the first day, you noticed. If you didn't practice the second day, your teacher noticed. And if you didn't practice the third day, everybody noticed. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the same with that type of policy. You can get away with it for a year, two years, three years, you really start to see the difference. And then you've got to play catch up. So I fully support everything that's been said on that. Um, and surely with all of this, what we need to be moving to is what we used to call in children's services early intervention. I know different departments give it a different name, but the more you can get in early to deal with the situation, it should be cheaper to sort and therefore that leaves more budget to do other things. So I've, I very much welcome this report and thanks for answering all my questions in advance. Thank you very much. Does anybody wish to come back or? We chair, 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 chair for me. Sorry, yeah. I'll let Councillor Brown go first and I'll, I will follow if I'm honest. Councillor Brown. Uh, yeah, well, uh, again, everybody will know my passion for preventive maintenance uh, rather than, uh, or provoke, sorry, proactive maintenance rather than uh, having to deal with things when they come along. I have asked, uh, uh, again, Matt and Jack to put forward a plan and it's in its final stages of where we will it won't be the old uh, parish maintenance units that we used to enjoy many, many years ago, um, but this will be a, a preventive maintenance unit so that we'll be able to get to problems before they grow. 
and I'm very keen on this. And part of that is actually included uh, in the uh, in in the budget that we're taking to full council uh, next week. So uh, uh, just to put Councillor Coombs mind at rest, I am fully supportive of what she says. Uh, we need to stop it uh, at an early stage and repair it at an early stage so it doesn't get out of control. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Chair, I've got a question there for whoever would like to answer. I appreciate this is a strategy document and it is a good document, which I'm fully supportive of. Point 12.5, non-illuminated sign maintenance strategy. Mm -hmm. Do we do any washing and cleaning of signs across the county? That doesn't seem to be mentioned there, sort of routine maintenance. It talks about replacement of them, but not actually maintaining whilst they're in position. Uh, to answer your question, Councillor Limited, uh, and it's it, this is one of the battles that we have within our uh, routine maintenance budgets of what we can actually uh, achieve. Um, our community highway officers are the key contacts with regards to all of the councillors' uh, locations if there's an issue, uh, and please contact them, councillor. Thank you. Have we, have we, do we ever devolve the responsibility for maintenance those or just routine cleaning to town and parish councils? Uh, we have. Sorry, Chair, for me. And, and this is the point for the future about future discussions. Um, the highway teams have what we call stronger together uh, agreements with town councils and parish councils about how we can share some of those resources and actually what town councils can actually uh, agree to pay to, for as well. Um, I'm always welcome to these discussions, Chair, if I may, and I think it's something that Dorset Council has to look to at the future. Um, so that, yeah. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. No, nobody, nobody else wishes to speak? We're not at this moment. Nobody's okay. indicating to speak. OK, we have a recommendation. Um, that the Place and Resources Overview Committee review and recommend for approval by Cabinet the proposed revised Highway Asset Management Policy and Strategy. Um, so can I have somebody to move and somebody to second, please? Chair, happy I'm happy to, happy to propose. Chair, Councillor Jesperson, happy right. to propose. Thank you, Councillor Jesperson. And Were you I'm happy ha to second there? I'm I am, yeah, I'm happy to second. That's great. Thank you very much. I will now move and ask John Selgren, um, Executive Director of Place, to confirm the Minded 2 decision. Thank you, Chairman. I'm very pleased to confirm that Minded 2 decision, having uh, considered the report and your discussion this morning and your uh, your approval to uh, progress that recommendation. I will take that forward under delegated authority uh, as, as you've requested. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Chair, I'd just like to confirm that Councillor Sherry Justin didn't want to do RTS to speak. Was that correct, Sherry? Yeah, absolutely correct. Thank you. No, no, to just to propose, which yeah. I can propose. Right. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Right, let's move on to item number seven, the uh, blue badge car parking charging policy. Um, presenting, we have Elizabeth Murray, who is our strategic parking project manager and who I must say has been incredibly helpful at all the questions and things we've been emailing back and forth. So thank you, Elizabeth. On you go. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, Councillor Jones, is it all right if I take over the screen to share yes, my please presentation? Do. Please thank do. You. So it just take a moment for me to do this. Um, Councillor Jones, could you confirm that you can see that? Please? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. OK, so as Councillor Jones has just said, I'm um, Elizabeth Murray and I work within Parking Services as the project manager. Um, so this morning I'll be presenting the proposed blue badge car park charging policy. So first of all, I'll talk through the current schemes and I'll give you the headlines from the public consultation and discussion groups. I will then share with you the highlights from the proposed charging policy. So parking Services is currently working under the parking orders of the former councils. This has meant that the former offer or that the offer for blue badge holders who park in Dorset Council car parks is different depending on the location that is visited. This has led to disparity of charges and it was recognised that along with other tariff alignment that this disparity needed to be addressed. So this slide shows the current schemes across the Dorset Council area. You can see that blue badge holders need to pay the full tariff in four locations at present, 
but there is at least one element of free parking in each of those locations. Wareham and Corfe Castle are the only locations that have free parking for all blue badge holders, but that is limited to three hours. This mix of offers is confusing for blue badge holders who need to check the rules for parking in each location prior to parking there. So a public survey was undertaken to gain a better understanding of what blue, badges, blue badge holders want and need. The survey also gave information on parking behaviour should different payment options be implemented. The public survey ran for just over six weeks and there were 1,513 responses received, which is an exceptionally good response for this type of survey. The largest number of respondents were blue badge holders or people responding on behalf of a blue badge holder at 71%. A further 20% were drivers or carers of blue badge holders, and we had two disability organisations who responded. There was good spread of responses from across the Dorset Council area and into the BCP Council area too. There were four charging options were proposed for consideration, and respondents were asked to rank the proposals by preference. The option was also given to suggest other solutions. The highest ranking option was three hours free parking with 35%, followed closely by one hours free parking when a pay and display ticket is purchased at 25%. Free parking for higher exemption blue badge holders was also popular with 20%. Free parking was not given as an option. This is because there is no control over free parking. For example, blue badge bays could be taken by a driver all day, thus taking away that facility for other blue badge holders. When the proposal had been written, it was presented to stakeholders for critical feedback. The stakeholders included blue badge holders or carers of blue badge holders, disability action and access groups, local charities and support organisations such as Age UK. Feedback from the discussion groups proved that the proposed policy is generally considered to be fair and does meet the needs of blue badge holders. The proposed charging policy was also shared with town and parish councils, bids and chambers of commerce for comment. So before giving you detail about the proposed policy, I just wanted to highlight that this only relates to Dorset Council car parks as there are government guidelines that set the parameters for blue badge on street parking. So that includes parking bays, yellow lines, loading bays, and Dorset Council cannot make any change to those rules. So this policy offers two concessions. So one hour additional parking for all blue badge holders when a valid pay and display ticket is purchased. And three hours free parking for blue badge holders with a restricted mobility parking permit. The purpose of this policy is not to give financial incentive or benefit to blue badge holders but it's designed to recognise the extra time that it may take blue badge holders to transition to and from their vehicle to their destination, and the fact that it may take longer to do what they need to do at their destination. So I'd just like to bring two details of the policy to your attention, and that is the criteria for the two concessions. So to support all blue badge holders, when a minimum tariff ticket is purchased, an extra one hour's parking is given on top of the tariff paid. This means that the blue badge holder can buy a 30 minute ticket, but be, would be able to park for an hour and 30 minutes on that ticket. We cannot give one hour free parking as this cannot be enforced. And as mentioned previously, this scheme is not about in financial incentive, but it is about making life easier for people with blue badges. The holder can park in any bay in the car park, 
which helps availability of spaces and also may assist in keeping blue badge bays free for those with adapted vehicles or need sp space around the vehicle to exit. So this slide shows the criteria for the restricted mobility parking permit. The criteria for this permit was reviewed at great length with all the discussion groups. It was felt this criteria was the best way of capturing those with the highest mobility needs. If a resident feels that they should receive a restricted mobility parking permit, but do not meet the criteria listed on this slide, they can contact the parking office to discuss and the parking team will liaise with our colleagues in adult social care and children's social care should guidance be needed. The restricted mobility parking permit can be used by blue badge holders in any parking bay, including disabled bays. I will now pass you to Councillor Ray Bryan to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Councillor Bryan, would you like to come in? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, can I congratulate uh, Elizabeth on the work she's done on this? This has probably been one of the more difficult uh, uh, papers to put together. Um, and once we get this through, um, I'll at least have at least an extra hour a week in my diary because that's how often we've been meeting to discuss this. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to say thank you to the team as well. Uh, Not Lacey Clark has uh, done some sterling work in assisting us in producing this uh, this policy. Um, as I say, it's very difficult when you're trying to harmonise across the whole council, but it is important that when visitors come into the area, they they only have one set of rules to follow. Um, uh, I could just imagine the uh, um, the confusion that would uh, that people face when they come into Dorset and they go across uh, the old district and borough lines to find there's a different policy in a different area. So that's what this policy is about. And so I think it's a well presented policy. It's um, it had a very good input from outside of the officer and members team and it was nice to see the public uh, participating in this. We listened to what they said and as I say I think uh, the paper in front of you um, uh, sums up the amount of hard work that has got into putting this together. Um, it was very kind of Elizabeth to say I'll answer all the questions but she better not disappear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Fry, who's first to speak? The first to speak, please, is Councillor Andrew Starr. Thank you. Come on in. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know if it's me, but this seems like a, a bit of a sledgehammer to crack a nut. If I am fully agree with um, harmonising the policy throughout the uh, Dorset Council area, but why not just pick one of the many variations that were already existing and say, right, well, we're going to apply that across the area? I don't quite understand about this additional um, permit. I believe in if to get a blue badge, you have to um, apply to the council, send all the relevant um, uh, uh, details about you know supporting your claim. But and then if you want to get one of these permits, you've got to apply again with the same relative de um, relevant details to uh, to get the, the permit and at be charged £15 for um, administration. I, it, it, I know it, people in the, the, the public will uh, you know, will have this vision of one chap sitting at one desk doing the blue badges and then someone sitting at another desk does the, um, the permit. But if you need the same details for, for both, I don't quite understand. Uh, can you please explain why um, we just couldn't just uh, adopt one of the, the processes that in one of the the uh, existing uh, towns and councils. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think that you're there are people that will have a blue badge that will not be eligible for the uh, for the extra permit, so they don't go hand in hand, but I'll, I'll come back here to Councillor Bryan. You're, you're absolutely right, Chairman, and which is why there's two. Um, I do um, want to just pick up this was a review of all of the policies that we had and we came out with a single solution. And uh, I understand uh, partially 
um, where Councillor Starr is coming from, but it's very difficult when you're trying to standardise because there wasn't an existing policy in the other councils that actually worked for us. A lot of hard work went into this and I do hope that um, the members will support this because uh, without this we're causing confusion with members of the public. They need to understand um, what the policy is and it will be clearly stated. Um, there won't be all the, um, obviously we're not going to send all this paperwork out to everybody, uh, so it'll be a single, single clear statement as to who parks where, when, how long they're allowed and what the alternatives are. The fact that you can use a blue badge in any bay in any car park I think is absolutely essential um, and I do feel that you know the disabled bays as they're known, I hate that word, um, are um, available for those that have a need with wider doors or need to get wheelchairs at the side of their car, uh, all sorts of facilities that we need to accommodate. Um, I'm in discussions with the parking team just so everybody knows about the dimensions of some of our parking spaces because I would like a review of that to be done. Um, you'll be amazed how much is going into just looking at parking and as I said earlier on, I meet with Elizabeth every week. In fact, I see more of her than I do my wife at the moment, um, but that's an aside. Um, but uh, um, I do understand where you're coming from, but hopefully you'll accept the fact that uh, um, to adopt a single policy from a from a, a historical um, um, council, um, we looked at them all and decided we, there wasn't a one that fitted, so we had to devise a new policy. Thank you very okay, thank much, you. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to come back on that? Yes, just just to add, so um, just to support what Councillor Ray Bryan was saying. So we did look at the other policies and what we came up with was that did actually stem from what we were already doing in um, West Dorset and in East Dorset, I think it was, um, who also had the two um, schemes of one hour and the higher exemption permit, as it was called in West Dorset. Um, the, the plan is that when people apply for their blue badge, they would actually be applying for their uh, restricted mobility permit at the same time. So it wouldn't be two separate functions. It's one function that's done all together. Um, Thank I you very that, much. That answers the question. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Fry, who's next? Uh, Councillor Van Pothoke, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Just to say, I think this is excellent work. Um, having done a review of car parking and blue badge parking some years ago, I know the effort it takes. And to be honest, it seems impossible to please everybody. But <laughs> I saw a wry smile there. Um, but it really is important that charges are aligned across the county. And I think uh, this two stage offer is really spot on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next is Councillor Tony Coombs, please. Thank you. Thank you. Come in. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Again, very good report. Um, I just have one question which I can't find reflected in the report and it picks up on the reflection made by Verwood Town Council when they considered the consultation and they were quite anti the view that it should be a two tier permit uh, because the continuum of disability is quite varied and they felt that there were people in the lower band that would be discriminated against by not being able to have the access that you get with the higher band. So I wondered if someone could come back to me on that, please. Thank you. Who would like to come back? I'm going to let Elizabeth put her 10 penny within and then I'll follow up. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I completely understand the concerns with this and, and, and because I, I thought it was such a sensitive area, when we had the discussion groups, it was really kind of threshed out. Is it fair? You know, is this what, you know, people need? Is this what people want? Is, you know, what is the best thing that's going to help? And, um, um, you know, with other uh, areas around us, such as with BCP, 
they don't give the one hour extra. So it's if your vehicle is tax exempt, then you you get free parking, but all other blue badge holders don't get get anything else. So we didn't want to have a scheme like that. We want to recognise that actually all blue badge holders do have some level of mobility issue that they do need some sort of extra support. So we felt that through the discussion groups that this was the best way of doing it. So we've got something for all blue badge holders. So whether it's, you know, you have the blue badge for uh, mobility issues or for other issues, you still have an extra hour because it may it may take longer, you know, to say get a child in and out of a car or something like that, if that's the reason why you have the the, perm, the blue badge. Um, but those that are really in need, so really don't have um, the ability to walk distances or carry things and matching in with those um, allowances that are on the criteria um, that meet the tax exempt allowances, that would be the fairest way. So everyone was getting what they needed. Thank you. Um, Councillor Coombs, did you want to come back or are, are you happy with that? I'm happy with that. Thank you. Thank you. I think Councillor Les Fry, you're next to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It's an interest a bit close to my heart. Paragraph 9.6 enforcement. Um, I know that what these blue badges are one of the most abused systems in the country and that um, you talk about enforcement. Who would enforce that? And do we have any record of the numbers that we would enforce on or have enforced over the years? Elizabeth, do you have that de detail? Um, I don't have those figures to hand. Obviously, our enforcement team do um, monitor blue badges. They do um, take blue badges from people who um, are misusing them. Um, I'm, I have seen that my uh, manager, Ma Matthew Pals, has come in, so I think he may yeah. want to add to that. Yes, please so, come in. So, so for my chair, um, we do enforce. Uh, there is misuse of the blue badge uh, issue, Councillor Fry, which uh, we have discussed in the past. It's one of the things we have to make sure is fair and transparent across the Peace Doors Council for all our residents um, and our visitors as well. But we will be looking at that as part of the future car parking improvements as well that Councillor Brown is aware of. Thank you, Matt and Chair, just to come back on that. I'm aware that the blue badge could be designed differently itself, but that's not, I don't believe, it within our remit at all. Um, but it, it, it basically it hides the, the details of the individual for obvious reasons, but that yeah. leaves it open to abuse by others who want to use that. Ray, do you want to admit something? Yeah, I just <laughs> want to say to you, uh, Les, that uh, if, if you require the information, I'm fairly sure the team will pull it out for you and forward it on to you. It's, it's not that uh, we don't have that information to hand, but we have the information and obviously you can let, let you have it outside of this meeting. That's absolutely fine, Councillor Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I um, think the next to speak, uh, Councillor Sherry Justins has withdrawn her RTS. Thank you. There's no one queuing up at the moment to speak. Okay. Or... Um, I, I, I'll just come in with something, please. I was looking at the um, comments from Bridport Town Council and they had what I thought was a, a good question in that um, with the restricted mobility permit, could visitors to Dorset apply for that? And could could they be available for visitors? Uh, uh, Councillor Brian, would you like me to answer that question? Yes, please, if you would. I'm just going through the paperwork. Yeah, so this this was another discussion that we had and yeah. we thought it's the fairest way that anyone who comes to Dorset can apply for it. And also we have people that are living right on our, our borders. So in the BCP area, you know, so people that are living very close who've you know, frequent into Dorset, the Dorset Council car parks. So we thought it was fairest to have it open to all. OK, and would people have to have um, apply via the council or could they perhaps, could you do something through the tourist information centres or local councils at all for that or, or not? Um, it's certainly something we could look into. At the moment, we were thinking through the council, but we could look at, at um, having it available through other. Um, OK, thank you. And, and sorry, just I, finally. It, Sorry, sorry, Ray, come in. Yeah, if I may, um, uh, I'm probably going to agree, uh, disagree with Elizabeth on this. I think it's absolutely <laughs> imperative that the council maintains the control over this. Uh, otherwise, it could get slightly out of hand. Okay. So uh, uh, we'll have a discussion. 
and if she feels strong enough, believe me, she'll fight her corner. OK, and, and finally from me, um, how are we going to disseminate this information to users? Um, will they will the information boards be changed on each parking uh, area? How will people know? Yeah, we're in the process of updating all the signs also to match the other changes that we're making in car parks. So that I have to say they're very, very nice uh, corporate branded, very clear, easy to read signs with the blue badge rules very clear on the sign as well. Obviously, it will be on our website as well. So when people apply for a blue badge, um, all the details will be on there. OK, thank you. Chair, thank you, yeah. Chair. I've got a further question and, and Councillor Val possibly would like to speak after me, please, if I may. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, is to Elizabeth and, and Elizabeth and I did communicate yesterday over this question, but I feel it's worth and appropriate to ask it in the public domain. Why do we give blue badge holders three hours free parking when there may be other people out there in, in a worse financial situation who would also like three hours free parking um, to suit their needs? Yes, yeah, so um, as I said in the presentation, the the policy is not based on a financial incentive or financial benefit. It's really about recognising that people with blue badges may take longer to do the things that they need to do. So from that point of view, it's not fair um, for them to pay for parking because, you know, for your average person, maybe it will take you an hour to park, get to the shops or get to the chemist post office and come back to the car. If you're in, um, you know, an adapted vehicle um, and you're in a motorised scooter, then that process will take so much longer. So that's why we're giving um, this free, not as a financial incentive, just to um, give that extra help to people who really need to be able to get, get around and take longer for them to get around. Thank you, Elizabeth. That's a very full and very good answer. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Next. Uh, Nick. Thank you. I, I was just going to come back on you, Les, there to say that um, I, could you imagine the level of department we would need to be checking everybody that was just hard up or, or absolutely, you know, it I, would I get be a that. nightmare. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Apothecary, you'd like to come in. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to propose that we approve this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do we have a seconder? Happy I'm to happy. second, Councillor Jesperson. Thank you very much. Um, OK, does anybody dissent? No, then in which case we'll go to John Selgren um, to confirm the minded to recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. And again, I've studied the, the report and uh, listened to your discussion this morning uh, on this uh, on this matter and um, the, uh, the, the recommendation uh, that you just made. So I will therefore take forward under delegation uh, that that uh, recommendation and to enact it uh, with immediate effect. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, we move on now to our next item, uh, the Queen Elizabeth Leisure Centre Future Management. This is going to be presented by Paul Rutter, our Service Manager for Leisure Services. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, good good morning, councillors. Um, so. This report looks at the role that Dorset Council has currently at QE Leisure Centre in Wimborne and considers the recommendation of withdrawing from the dual use agreement. This is not about closing the centre, but it's about understanding how a different management arrangement could impact on users, residents and staff. If the council does decide to withdraw, then it would be required to give two years notice. So in terms of background, the Leisure Centre is actually owned by the QE School Foundation trustees, but Dorset Council manages the facilities under the dual use agreement, and this provides access for the school and community use. The council is currently subsidising the Leisure Centre by around £550,000 per annum. And as previously mentioned by the portfolio, this is around a third of the overall leisure budget, which actually covers uh, eight other facilities. So why is this? Well, it's mainly down to the high level of competition around QE. You know, it was previously mentioned there's eight public leisure facilities within a 20 minute drive time of the centre and there's several private and budget gyms. We've been in discussions with the school for over a year now and discussed various future management arrangements. Whilst the school would prefer the status quo, 
uh, this, they have made it clear that they would look at all avenues to retain their sports facilities and have highlighted the sports halls, netball, tennis and athletic facilities as things that they would be able to retain. But actually, they would have to look at maybe funding implications of maintaining the swimming pool and replacing the all-weather pitch in the future. Wimborne Academy Trust, which is the umbrella organisation um, of, of QE School, already operate a swimming pool at another local uh, school site and they don't receive external funding but they do receive income from hiring out the pool to swim schools and community groups so this is is, is potentially seen as a, as a as a sort of a model that could be replicated as say Wimborne Academy Trust are already used to opening their their schools and their leisure facilities to community groups and they said that they would like to do, they would want to do this at QE. They have, however, confirmed that they wouldn't be able to provide a like for like operating model which accommodates individuals using the centre. So any change in the joint use agreement would have an impact on the exceptional circumstances that's previously been agreed with the Education and Skills Funding Agency. As a result, secure any future funding through this route, the school would need to work with the council to uh, to approach ESFA, uh, the Education and Schools Funding Agency, and submit a new application. So in terms of the consultation, um, you, you will see that there's been extensive feedback in, in that you can read through in the appendices. Um, we had um, just under 1800 responses. Um, we had a, a some petitions and, and a few individual letters that's all detailed um, within the report. For us, I guess the key thing was to understand the impact on users, residents and staff. Um, so whilst we received an extensive range of comments, the main perceived impacts have been covered in section 13 of the report. It's clear that many of these responses have been based on the centre closing. So whilst concerns over how the housing growth and travel have been considered, the likelihood is that many of those who commented and future residents would still be able to access facilities at QE School. The consultation does, however, present that over 50% of respondents have or do use one or more other local facilities and I'm sure no doubt many other residents who didn't complete the questionnaire would also use other facilities. So the council would be committed to meet any contractual obligations that it has uh, prior to any exit and a capital bid of 731,000 has been put forward to cover the 60% contribution of, of the, the works that would need to be done prior to the end of March 24. The council would look to leave the facilities in a good condition and complete these capital works prior to exit. On the back of the consultation feedback, a further capital bid is proposed up to 150,000, which would enable the all weather pitch to be replaced. And this would benefit both QE School and the community. It would also allow QE School to generate enough income to create a sinking fund for any future replacement. The staff at the Leisure Centre are employees of the Council. Any retained staff would be covered by 2P regulations. If not retained uh, by QE School, then staff may transfer to other leisure sites that the Council directly manages and any remaining staff would be subject to the council's redundancy process at the cost of the council. However, with a potential two year lead in time, there should be an opportunity to identify ways to mit mitigate any adverse impact on existing staff. So moving forward, if, if the recommendations are approved, we would continue to, to support QE School during this transitional period in identifying ways to maximise the availability of leisure facilities for the school and community, work with them on any future uh, ESFA funding applications, and we would certainly look to support any displaced users who may need assistance in identifying opportunities to maintain their activity levels. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um... We move to the portfolio holder, Councillor Laura Miller. 
Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you to, to Paul. Um, bringing a paper like this um, that you know is not going to be popular um, is a difficult thing to do. And I would just like to thank the team that have put this together, um, led by Paul, because it is comprehensive. Um, we're not closing a facility that we, we don't own. And really, it's about being able to hold our heads up and say that we are providing equitable opportunities across um, Dorset council area. And um, I suppose the salient point for me really is that I can't say that while well, one facility is taking up a third of the budget. So um, I anticipate, and I can see from the chat bar, there's a lot of questions. Um, very happy to take them. Um, Paul will be on hand to help with the details um, and just to recommend this, this report to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Miller. Uh, Councillor Fry, who, who, who do we bring in first? Councillor Maria Rowe first, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm the ward member for Coal Hill and Wimborne Minster East, and many of my residents use the QE facilities. The facilities are very important to them, and in addition to responding to the consultation, many people have contacted their councillors, they have signed petitions, one of which reached 450 signatures, they have written to their MP, and also the local newspaper. There can be no doubt that there is a depth of feeling at the prospect of this great loss. I have three questions, but before I ask one, <coughs> um, I just wanted to state the following. I'm afraid there are many inaccuracies in the report. Um, one that I would like to highlight that the number of houses built in and around QE are far greater than 757 quoted and more than three developments. There are many new developments and the number is more like 2000 new houses with another 500 expected in the draft local plan. Um, my first question refers to the apparent lack of alternative proposals which may have been explored and dismissed. In this paper, alternative solutions don't appear to have been investigated. There's absolutely no reference to the full process of decision making. And due to an historic funding anomaly, Dorset Council proposes to withdraw all funding to the Sports Centre, which so many communities use. My first question is, were other scenarios and solutions considered? And if so, please, can you go through them? Thank you. Um, Paul, would you like to come yeah. back on this? Thank you, Councillor. Um, so the, the Council has previously um, engaged consultants, uh, Max Associates, to, to do a leisure review. Um, and as a result of that, we, we looked at various operating options um, across all of our leisure facilities. Um, and these options were, were discussed with the school. So in terms of, um, I think the key thing is that, that the options that, that, you, that, that potentially are out there are not shut off at this point. So in theory, um, if, if another operator wanted to come forward, and 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 discuss with the school around operating the site or if a community group wanted to come forward there's still those opportunities what we did discover was that that the the um continued operation of a of a third party operator would still require substantial um council's subsidy um and it was seen as as not um uh, much of a reduction on the existing provision and and this was discussed with the with the school in the previous year and, and recognised without a, all you know substantial funding it would be uh, unable to to proceed with that option. But that doesn't mean that other organisations couldn't step forward over this two year transitional period. 
can can I just come back? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so that the, the council could have um, subsidised um, the leisure facility at a, a a lower amount of funding, but the school declined that. Is that is that correct? No. The if if a third party operator came in, it was based on some um, forecast figures prior to COVID. Um, it would bring a, a small reduction on the existing subsidy provided for um, QE Leisure Centre. But I guess the key thing and, and, and what Councillor Miller has has already said, you know, this is a substantial amount of the Count's overall budget being funded on one facility in an area where there are, you know, seven or eight other public facilities with a 20 minute drive time. I mean, I would dispute that it's a 20 minute drive. Um, it takes a lot longer to get to these facilities. But uh, can I move on? Yeah. Um, so uh, the, the paper states that the consultation is only one part of the decision making process. Yeah. Um, can you just go through the stages of the decision making process? Um, is is there something more than the work that the consultants? Uh, no, so that so that that basically considers a number of different factors. So one of the key you know key factors is what what is it currently costing the council? What how does that compare as part of the overall budget? What what alternative provision is in that local area? So there's a lot of sort of desktop exercise that was done initially prior to then consulting with users and local residents to understand how they would be impacted. So what I guess the point is that the, the decision has not been made solely on just the response from the consultation. I think that that's the, the, um, the thing that's missing in the paper. Um, you know, I, I've, I've read it several times yeah. and I, I honestly cannot see the decision making yeah. process in the so, so 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 just to confirm um this this matter has been considered through the um committee process on previous occasions so so this there was a previous cabinet meetings that actually recommended that we went to consultation on the back of that other information so this is sort of the 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 sort of final part of it was the consultation. So there have been previous committee reports on QE Leisure Centre and on future management arrangements. Thank you. Councillor okay. Rowe, do you have any other questions? Yes, I have my last uh, question. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it's it's about the, um, the clubs that operate um, out of the QE Centre. So clubs will uh, undoubtedly fold. Um, and clubs will, which compete nationally and internationally, will fold. Um, so 43 clubs responded to the consultation. Um, I just want to highlight a few. So the netball club needs four floodlit courts and there's nowhere else for them to play. So netball is a popular sport and in Wimborne, 270 women girls are members of the club. It's a feeder for them to play nationally. And the athletics club has many up and coming athletes and one member from Wimborne has actually qualified to represent us in Team GB in the Olympics. Wimborne Wayfarers Hockey Club have members who over the years played national and international level. The ladies first 11 currently play in the Hampshire Premier Division. They have junior members who play for UK Lions, one of which is an England under 16 trialist. All of this success, which Dorset can rightly be proud of, if, the, if they can no longer play at the QE, the club will, will fold. Thank you, um, Councillor Rowe. I'm um, coming think... to my question. So it's why is the hockey pitch renewal not included in the condition surveys works? 
which the council is legally bound to complete. The need for the pitch renewal has been referenced in council papers since April 2019. So it seems strange it is now left out. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I know that Councillor Miller would like to come back in on this, but I, I just would like to say that there seems to be a perception that if Dorset Council pulls out, that it will close, and that is not necessarily the case at that all. the clubs will fold. That not if they can continue to use clubs the fold. I'd like to come to Councillor Miller now to, to um, uh, respond to you. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I will go to Paul for the detail um, on the question of the, the hockey pitch. Um, but but really, I just wanted to respond, as as you said, um, you know, Councillor Rowe, I, I appreciate that these groups have concerns and I appreciate that, you know, they they they, they use this facility and, you know, n nobody is is sort of suggesting that these achievements that you've just listed are not fantastic. They are fantastic. Um, but as you say, your whole sort of question was 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 assuming that QE would close and that the clubs would fold. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about withdrawing our management of a facility that we don't own that costs a third of the budget and supporting the owners of that facility into making it sustainable for the future. So I, I think we've got to be quite careful. This meeting is not about closing a leisure centre. Um, Paul, are you able to provide that um, detail? around the hockey pitch and why that's not in the report because the report does yeah. clearly does clearly outline our responsibilities as an outgoing management um manager i suppose and and we have no intention of sort of um moderating or wriggling out of those so could you provide that detail please Brilliant. yeah I, th I think um just just first of all just to follow up on your on your last point and in response to uh councillor rose question and that is that the proposal moving forward the school have made it very very clear that all of the facilities that you've mentioned whether it be the netball courts the, the athletic facilities um the sports halls the all weather pitch they have every intention of maintaining those and retaining those facilities for school use they have every intention of continuing to open up those facilities for the community so actually those groups all of the ones that you have mentioned have got every opportunity to continue to use the facilities in fact they will generate sufficient income that will support the school in in retaining those facilities and quite critical and i think those points in particular about the netball and the hockey and the athletics have been referenced in in my report um in terms of the all weather pitch um the capital works condition works um that were drawn up the the replacement of the all weather pitch falls outside or beyond the date of which the council would potentially exit i.e being the end of march 2024 however as part of this report, um, it's recognised the value and the importance of that facility and the, the, the potential difficulty that the school may have in, in uh, securing sufficient funds for its future replacement and has therefore proposed a uh, capital uh, uh, application for for up to 150,000 to to actually replace that pitch so that is something that we are looking to commit to do as part of any exit strategy thank you uh councillor fry who would who would next person is, next person to speak is councillor sherry jesperson please thank you very much thank you very much madam chairman um obviously i have sympathy with the position of the uh or have I frozen? No, of the position of the local residents. But the stark fact in this report of the um, inequitability of the funding, where one third of the leisure service budgets goes to one leisure facility that Dorset Council doesn't even own. We've known about this since Dorset Council's inception, and one way or another, 
that stark fact was going to have to be addressed. It was quite in, inconceivable that we could have gone forward um, with, with uh, that situation. And I have to say, I do appreciate, because I was involved in some of this work in the early days, the amount of work that has gone into um, the, arriving at the position we are now um, and, and the report that's before us. So um, I, I have to say, I, I do realise that, it, that it's, hard, it's hard to hear for the residents of Winborne, but for the, for the rest of us, it was something that we really needed to see addressed. But if we are to uh, support this, if Cabinet are to support this report, um, I think it's important that we uh, do everything we can to get from where we are now to where we will, uh, we will end up. Um, in as seamless a way as we possibly can. So I'd like to ask the portfolio if she could outline and give the committee some um, confidence of what Dorset Council is going to be to smooth the, that transition and to give all the support that we can to the trust um, to arrive at a sustainable future position. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Miller. Um, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Councillor Jesperson. Um, that, that's a very considered question and I'm grateful for it. Um, I mean, Paul, Paul has outlined um, broadly some of the sort of financial support that we would be looking to provide in addition to our contractual obligations. Um, I think probably what you're asking is the sort of moral responsibility of, of trying to work over the two year period to really get the the owner of that facility into a position where they're sustainable um, going forward. It is it is difficult, but we do have a commitment to do that. Um, you know, I know from the work that Paul has done that, you know, this isn't just a question of walking away. This is a question of doing all we can to make sure it is sustainable. And like you said, um, Councillor Jesperson, and like I've said, it does have to be more equitable. You know, we cannot justify this. Um, huge spend to one facility when th there there are places literally down the road that receive no funding um, and and are sustainable. So so we want to we want to work over the next two years to make sure that QE can can run their facility in a way that continues to serve people, um, but is more equitable to Dorset residents. Paul, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, um, I think the key thing is that the Wimborne Academy Trust and, and, and QE School, they do have experience of operating large buildings and um, basically um, hiring out their, their facilities for community use. We I've touched on the uh, other local school that they have that has a swim pool and leisure facilities, all, albeit on a, on a smaller scale. Um, but in terms of um, we would obviously offer, you know, any any sort of leisure management support in 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 dealing with uh, programming or, or looking at opportunities for for more groups to use the facilities and therefore generating income. Um, we would certainly have the support of our of our property surveyors in in regard to who who will know all about the building and and how it all works and everything else. And clearly, we would continue to support. Um, the school, not just through the transitional period, but we would also, you know, if queries came up after any exit date, we would provide that support. And again, as previously mentioned, you know, our education colleagues will 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 work with with the school in regard to any any further uh, applications to ESFA. So there's a number of of ways that we we can provide support. I think the key thing is is that. We've been meeting regularly with the school over the last year or so, and we will continue to do that. So we will, you know, deal with issues as they come up and, and, and provide support where we can. Thank you very much. I can see that uh, Councillor Andrew Starr has come up. Please speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, I received a, uh, an email from uh, a Councillor Wimborne Town Council quite late yesterday with an attachment with a very long sort of blow by blow account of why he and they don't like this. But I must I must admit that the whole thing seemed to be based on the assumption that it was going to close. And I'm encouraged to, to hear that that is something that uh, you intend to help 
ensure it doesn't happen. And it's it is a bit hard to look at you. None of us have got a crystal ball, so it, it's, it is a bit difficult to know what is exactly is going to happen. But um, it just occurred to me, though, that um, given that Wimborne um, Town Council has been having, shall we call it, say, a, a little local difficulty of late, um, were they, are you satisfied that they were properly consulted on this issue? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Starr, that, that letter um, came into the council too late for it to be considered or read out at today's meeting, but I know that Councillor Miller is going to be responding yeah. directly to, to them. Councillor Miller. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor Starr. Um, yeah, I've already responded to the representative of Wimbo Wimborne Town Council. Um, and actually, you know, I, I, I was sort of thinking, you know, I, I really would like to respond. I really would like that to be considered at this meeting, but it just came in too late. And um, when I responded to them, they said that's OK. It, it wasn't intended for this meeting. Um, they didn't expect that it would be that quicker turnaround and they're really happy um, with with the full written response that I've committed to, to provide to them, which won't be too long following. It just, as you say, couldn't couldn't do it the next day. In terms of consulting, um, yeah, um, I, I, I am reassured. I think the town council have had the opportunities that they need to have had. Um, to respond and to make their views known as a as a local town council, I don't. Um, I'm I'm not going to comment on any difficulties they may have had with within themselves or as an organisation or or anything else. Um, I'm I'm not sure that's relevant uh, because the consultation was you know it was some time ago and and they've been engaged with as as much as we would engage with any local town or parish council. Um, so, so I am reassured, but I, I am grateful also for, you, for your understanding. So um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Starr. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I can see Councillor Tony Coombs is next. Thank you, Chairman. I cannot resist picking up on um, one last comment. At my recollection, the QE campus and the leisure centre is actually based in Pamp Hill, not in Wimborne Minster. So it's a completely different parish. Um, but moving on, I've been involved with QE Leisure Centre in the past as a member of East Dorset back in the day on the joint use and I was also involved in it from a Dorset County Council later on, um, again on the joint use. So I understand the difficulty of a 1974 agreement that has caused all count, this council and predecessor councils difficulty um, with some of the um, obligations under that contract and I think everyone agrees that the current agreement is not fit for purpose and I was very pleased um, to hear that the contribution towards the hockey pitch would be a goodwill gesture um, to help move things forward but as difficult as the current agreement is, I'm still left wondering um, on a couple of points. So the first one is. We've got a two year notice period. And then we have the cliff edge apart from the sweetener of the hockey pitch. What scope is there within the existing agreement to say well actually yes we've given the two years notice but could we do a tapering subsidy beyond that to ease the transition further for the school because I was looking at the level of subsidy which in the report says that we currently pay around £550,000 a year. The school also gets the um, education skills grant of around just under £280,000 uh, last year, which comes to roughly, so all the figures are rounded, £830,000 a year. That's quite a huge difference for the school to make up as a cliff edge, particularly if um, some of the groups decide not to go forward. So there's that little element, but also we are talking about 
no further subsidy at the end of that two years that we're walking away completely and yet we have a leisure budget and we do subsidize other centers so the second question is what would be an equitable subsidy to provide that parity from this council to help ensure that that provision remains in the eastern dorset area um and my last question which i should have written down was when I first got into politics um, years ago, one of the things was actually about leisure provision. And that was something that I felt very strongly. And at that time, particularly looking at swimming pool provision, Sport England said that there was a two lane deficiency of swimming pool availability within the wider area. So where do we stand now with suitable premises or swimming pools for people to access across the whole of the East Dorset area because if I understand that all the dry side is um, likely to, to continue because it's affordable whereas I understand the cost of running a swimming pool and that if we lose that what then is the cumulative impact on the rest of the community? Sorry, they're a bit long and involved questions. <laughs> Thank you. Who would like to come in first? Laura. If, if I could come in first and then go backwards through the questions um, and, and, and through some of those points, that'd be great. And Paul, please pull me up on detail. I'm very happy to be interrupted. Um, really helpful comments um, from Councillor Coombs. I think if you go backwards, it's interesting the, the sport in England comment about the two lane deficit. Um, it's also interesting that a lot of the work that we've done more widely with Sport England has sort of highlighted the changes in usage um, of leisure more broadly. So uh, before I became a councillor, I would have said leisure is leisure centres. That's, that's your swimming pool, that's your netball pitch, that's your tennis court. Leisure is leisure centres. You know, my local one was Purbeck. You'd go there, have a cup of tea, your kids would do gym or whatever. Looking at some of the comments from Sport England on the wider work that we've done about how people's habits are changing and, you know, how we're accessing country parks, how active travel is becoming much more of a, a thing, and I'm really glad it is, and how, you know, that traditional model of um, going and playing a team sport um, whilst still really valuable, um, you know, and Councillor Rowe highlight, highlighted that very nicely earlier. Um, the leisure facilities that the council contributes to and runs uh, more widely, you know, include country parks and you know, we've got orienteering trails and things like that. And, you know, certainly just from my own and my family's experiences, we might once have gone swimming um, we would probably go pa paddle boarding now. Um, you know, with wetsuits, people people's habits change. And so I think um, Sport England has evolved um, the information that it, it, it's sharing with local councils. And, and that habit change, I think, is particularly valuable to, to note. Um, Paul can probably comment about the two lane deficiency um, because I know work has been done around um, alternative provision in the area and how much of it there is and how much it's used um, and, and information around that. Uh, the other two questions were on um, ongoing subsidy and I think that's also, um, I will check in with Paul again on the detail, but that's also worth noting that we have, this is, this is part of our um, leisure services review more widely, um, so we are looking to be more equitable um, and we are looking in terms of sort of area and alternative provision locally. Um, Paul, do you want to come in with, I think Councillor Coombs mentioned the possibility of a tapering subsidy. I think the point about the cliff edge um, before you come in, uh, that's the whole point of the two year um, uh, period where we work with um, the trust and, and the centre because the whole point is that we don't want there to be a cliff edge, that we work in that two year period to really get that sustainable. And, and as Paul highlighted before, you know, we've got considerable sort of legal and grants and, you know, advisory capacity. So we really want to utilise that in that two year period so there isn't a cliff edge. 
Um, but Paul, if you could please come in specifically on the two lane swimming deficit and your comments on that would be helpful and also the tapering subsidy possibility and um, that would be really helpful thank you yeah I, I think I think the I think the key thing to to sort of bear in mind here is that you know the the ambition for everyone is is to retain the swimming pool um and as I said you know, other schools have got swimming pools on their site, may not receive external funding um, that they, that, you know, from ESFA and are actually able to make it work. So because it would be a different operating model, I think we need to recognise that if the school were to operate the facilities, it would be very much based on a sort of a community groups using the facilities and paying for for, for higher charges it they've got scope to to hire it out and run swim schools there um and everything else so I, I i think that i think everyone's on board for for trying to make that happen and i think that's where we've got this two-year uh potential sort of window to explore all those various opportunities and everything else and certainly in, in, as part of the capital works we'll be looking to make ensure that the the pool is is up to scratch in terms of maintenance and everything else moving forward um so it won't be a sort of a an ongoing sort of costly impact in in operating that facility um clearly there's other pools that have opened up since those what you reference you know um the, the Corf mullen club wouldn't have been referenced in that two two lane shortfall that's open to the public for example you know under three miles away so so there's a number of sort of you know the, the position keeps moving um but i think the key thing is about trying to find a way to to maintain that facility and and with regard to the tapering approach what i mean what i would say is overall um and and as councillor miller has said we are looking to um try and ensure that we have equity of our funding across the dorset council area and we're certainly trying to um you know uh, address areas of, of health inequalities and and uh, that's something that that's sort of going to be a key thing moving forward um, currently because there are three facilities in um, in the East Dorset area the actual funding overall is far greater in East Dorset even if you take out the QE um, funding um, so whilst it would be for members to decide whether they wanted to provide some further financial support in the future and it might be something that that had to be that was maybe considered um you know at this point i think we're we're, we're sort of hopeful that we'll be able to retain that um those facilities that the school will be able to benefit from and the local community will be able to benefit from can i ask a supplementary please of course um Given that we have got this two year window, if, for example, a community group comes forward, do I assume that something could be put in place to allow that to start before the end of the two year period so that we do get that transition and therefore there would be some financial benefit to the school in being proactive? I'm happy to come in, Chair. Thank you. Um, just really that that I think you know would be a decision um, for, for the owner of the facility but I'm assuming Paul that if um, if if another company a community company or, or any other company expressed an interest then that would be part of our two-year withdrawal and and that preparation for not having a cliff edge but again I think the ongoing um, decision for that and the ultimate decision would be with the owner of the facility um, Paul have I got that right yeah um yeah ultimately um the decision would be with with the qe uh, school foundation trustees um clearly if somebody came forward with a with an alternative uh, proposal um to to maybe run you know a community group or or a third party operator to to run the facilities then we would certainly be able to uh, support the school um, you know, carry out some sort of due diligence on on any sort of proposals that are submitted, and um, yeah, I mean, if it, if that that created a a a better solution in the long run, then we would certainly be 
most keen to uh to to engage with the school and support them through through that process but ultimately it would be their decision because it's their leisure center it's their land it's it's not That's for us fine. To I, was, I was that. talking more about our subsidy during that two-year period to allow something to come forward and give the financial benefit while while we have yeah. our continued two-year subsidy that was yeah all. i mean i mean we we have a commitment we would have a commitment subject to, to a decision being made we would have a commitment for, for that two year period, both in terms of of continuing to subsidise the facilities, continuing to maintain the facilities and continuing to meet any contractual obligations. If anything changed in that period and that was brought forward, then, you know, it's for us, it, it's we have a we have a requirement to give a minimum of two years notice. The school could easily come back to us and say, do you know what, we only we, we want to change things in a year. That would that would be that would be, you know, acceptable. Right, thank you. Councillor Coombs, are you happy with that? I am, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fry, I see you're next to speak. Yeah, no, I just think this is an, a potentially an exciting opportunity for the QE Leisure Centre. To me, when you've got an organisation that's been given £550,000 a year to fund it, why would they want to be proactive? Why would they want to be to look at how they operate? Why would they want to look at their charges and the conditions? And I've had a couple of complaints to me about the, the situation there. And I think this is an opportunity for a community group to get together to find some well-trained, skilled trustees to take the centre forward, looking at their or reviewing their charges, that what they could charge the groups, and even the groups can come together. There's no reason why this centre has to shut if you get people together with the support of Windor and Town Council. Councillor Coombs may raise a good point, and I think I would support some form of tapering finances, but that will hopefully be looked at in the due course as they go forward. But this, with, with more houses being built in Wimborne, 757 houses, what an ideal opportunity to increase your capacity there and bring in new businesses there. So I think this is an opportunity that they should grab and take forward and be motivated to, to, to learn and, and go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fry. I see Councillor Batstone is next. Thank you, Chairman. Just a brief comment. Um, as someone who used to be a user of the QE and it's absolutely brilliant um, and now living in the depths of rural Dorset. Um, the presumption on the part of those, a lot of those who've written in has been the world is going to end, everything's going to close and the swimming pool is going to disappear. And we've heard that there is um, considerable thought being given to how uh, the provision can move forward in Wimborne. We went through um, a trauma some years ago in Sturminster when uh, th there was a reconsideration of the joint use facility here. We have Sturfit Leisure Centre, as you know, and uh, what Les has just said, I think has happened that people have come forward from the community um, who want to make it a thriving place. It's hard work for them, but it, it works. The world did not end when the facility, the, the support of the local authority changed. So just a comment, Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much. I think all of our members have spoken, but I, I think Councillor Robin Cook wants to come in next. Um, is that right, Councillor Fry? Yes, that's correct, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and, and good morning. Uh, very, very uh, interesting and stimulating debate. And can I first of all thank Councillor Coombs for clarifying the position? Uh, because yes, um, QE School of the Leisure Centre is actually in my ward and it's in the parish of Pampill and Shappick. And it's one thing that we're proud of many things, but it's one thing that we are proud of in that parish that we've got the school and the leisure centre there. I too, as indeed Councillor Coombs, sat on what was then the East Dorset, um, the QE Consultative Leisure uh, Committee, as it was known many years ago at East Dorset. So I've seen some of the trials and tribulations that this centre has been through in terms of membership and, and uh, investment, etc. Um, a businessman of long standing in Wimborne, but a businessman anyway, um, I fully understand the business case that's been made here and the figures that we're looking at, you know, £550,000 on one leisure centre, a, th a, th a third of the total budget, you know, it doesn't make sense, does it? I've had a lot of interest, shall I say, from the community on this one, to say the least. Um, a question that's cropped up regularly, which I haven't been able to answer specifically, is 
why does it why does it take five hundred fifty thousand pounds as opposed to the others? That was a question. Uh, so maybe somebody would like to comment on that. But if I can, Chair, I would just like to go on without repeating what's already been said and what hopefully members have already read. There's been a lot gone before. Um, officers and indeed the portfolio holder and her predecessor, I know, have worked very very hard on getting to where we are today. So it's not been done lightly. And as you quite rightly said, uh, this is not about closing QE, but it is about loss of control over QE, uh, ostensibly at the end of two years, if it's recommended. Because at the moment, with the input that we've got, 550,000 pounds and a degree of contribution towards maintenance, does give us a degree of control whilst we don't own it. At the end of two years, we will lose that control. And as you've said, the school will be the decision maker. And so I am concerned that whilst we have worked hard, have we done enough to research what other options would be available? Notwithstanding, we don't own the building. I do still appreciate that. Um, I think the idea of uh, the Tony Coombs mentioned, and I certainly put in my notes, was about um, a tapering off rather than having a cliff edge. I think that was a very, very valid point, uh, not to cut it at the end of two years, or perhaps be a little bit more open-ended so we can perhaps firm up a little bit more on the proposals, which I will say with respect to officers are a little bit woolly. There's lots of ifs and buts in the report, but nothing specific. When you read the it's interesting the results of the, the consultation make very interesting reading but a lot of it in there is about driving to other venues now most people drive to qe leisure center because of its location but that's actually one of its advantages because it's located very very rurally and access is incredibly easy you haven't got to negotiate that much heavy traffic or not a lot of an urban environment to, to, to get there and the parking is adequate. Most of the other centres, the ones we've heard about that within 20 minute drive, um, they are based on the main, in the main in more urban locations and access and parking is much more difficult on those. So I can understand people feeling they didn't want to drive to those, uh, although they will drive to QE. So we have to consider the access. We also have to consider QE Leisure Centre offers much more of a one-stop shop. It's got lots of special facilities under the one roof that are perhaps spread amongst the other uh, local facilities. And so you could go as a family. I remember in my younger days, I used to go and have a game of squash. Uh, um, my wife took my son to have swimming lessons. So we went as a family under one roof. And this is what's happened. The community, it's it's not just about usage, it's about a community feel. And a lot of the users I know now, adult users, were QE school pupils, and they had the benefit of it when they were pupils at the school and what it offered. They've gone on to adulthood and they're using it themselves and their children as they go forward. So it has that, that loyalty factor. And I think that was mentioned in the report or touched upon in the report anyway. So it does mean a lot to the community in terms of what it, what it is. Now, if, I'm going to go on a bit and Carol, Chairman, please no, tell me to could, shut up. Could you please to. try and wrap it up, my darling? I will, I will. Thank you. I do think, it, in a nutshell, we ought to investigate more options. It, for example, it serves mainly the BH21 area. Uh, now, the BH21 area has great swathes of people residing outside the Dorset Council area. So whilst they might contribute to the usage in terms of paying uh, admission or membership, they don't contribute through taxation towards supporting it. So maybe there's an option there to look at, to talk to neighbouring authorities to get support. Les Fry mentioned opportunity. Uh, yes, we've got tremendous opportunity. Some inward investment could actually make that a state of the art facility and it would knock spots off its competitors. So I think there is a lot more we could do. I would love to see the decision, the recommendation that's going forward to Cabinet also contain an add on that maybe this is deferred for much more detailed investigation. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Would anybody like to come in? Because I'm not sure that there was a direct question there, I but Laura, you're, go for it, Laura. Thank you. Yeah, just on a couple of those points. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure how much more detailed we could be, um, Robin. I, I, I appreciate your um, summary 
of of the strength of feeling in the area and I totally get it I, I absolutely get it and that's why we're not you know this isn't our facility and we're not closing it um, and, I, and I will not apologize for continuing to hammer that point because it's important um everything you say is is valid and 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 i understand that people value it that's apparent that's really apparent and that's actually a really good thing um because as councillor fry outlined there are opportunities there um i'm wary i will be honest i'm, I'm wary of approaching another authority and saying could you please um financially contribute to a facility that we contribute to um but that we don't own. Um, that that's very difficult, and I think that could give rise to a precedent where we might find ourselves. And I I just think it, it muddies the waters quite a lot. Um, on muddying the waters, um, you, you sort of referred to the report as being a little bit woolly. Um, are there any specific points that you would like, Paul? I say Paul because he's closer to the detail um, to, to clarify, because I think, you know, what we've tried to set out really clearly is that there has been a huge amount of work gone into this and that we're not proposing a, a cliff edge. We are proposing to continue to work closely with the owners over the next two years to make this sustainable, but also to ensure equity for, for other parts of Dorset, because, you know, we, we um, I was asked in a radio interview about this, um, this very thing. And, and actually my comment was, I, ca I can't, how do I go to, to Gillingham, to Weymouth, to Lyme Regis, to Sturminster, to Shaftesbury um, and say, actually, Wimborne is consuming a third of the, of the budget. And I think we all recognise that that's not equitable or sustainable. But if there are any specific points that you want clarified, I'm really happy to clarify them. Um, but just to really stress that point that there isn't going to be a cliff edge and we are going to spend two years helping the owner to make this sustainable. Thank you, Laura. Um, I would just also say the reason that you may think that there is no clear or, or things may be woolly is that the, ultimately the decision of how to go forward is not ours to make, it's the trustees. Um, Paul, did you want to come back in? Um, no, I, th I think you've just summed it up really, really clearly there. There are, as you say, this is around our decision around with use agreement. The decisions that come after that, the majority of which are going to be in the school's hands, but we're going to work with them during that two year period. So I think there'll be a lot more detail and clarity, you know, post any decision during that two year period. Thank you. I did see that Councillor Ray Bryan wanted to come in, but he has to go off to another meeting. I don't know if he's still there to come in quickly before we go to uh, Councillor Kimber. You're still there, Ray. Come in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, um, this is all about DC trying to find the right solution. Um, and I want to add that uh, for those that aren't aware, as part of the Salex funding that we've got, uh, we're actually installing uh, PV panels, uh, LED lighting to try and reduce the costs of running the sport hall, which will actually make it more viable going forward. This is all part of the plan. Uh, I just wanted to mention that so that people don't think we're just trying to walk away. We're not. We're doing everything we can uh, to make um, the QE viable for the future. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come in. I've made it by two minutes for my next meeting. Thank <laughs> well you. done, off you go. Thank you very much. I think we've got Councillor Paul Kimber now. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me OK? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for letting me come in on this debate. And I have sw swum it at the pool. I had to organise a relay team for the co-op once. Um, one of the ideas I wanted to pass on to you was, um, I don't know if any of you have been down to Portland to the Osprey Quay, uh, Paul. Uh, it's the most fantastic uh, indoor gym and it's a community led. It was let, it, it was instigated by the, the uh, local health uh, centre. Uh, we had one of the doctors there, Paul Mason, who um, was there with um, one of our, uh, with a few of the count, council officers and what we've done, uh, we've produced an excellent centre that gives 
a lot of assistance to people going through health issues. Now, normally that can't be done if you like say so much. In, I'm not saying we can't do it in the council, like fun, Paul, but uh, it, it, it's very, very noticeable. Um, my suggestion is we've got a manager down there with a lot of expertise. Um, if I let you into a secret, uh, when we have uh, issues around swimming pools, I, I, I always ask our manager for his opinion, and he's got a, a, a massive amount of knowledge countrywide on how pools can run successfully. Now, I know what they've done is they've got covers over the pools and we got to turn uh, solar or t solar type heat in, in, in the pool so to reduce the bills all the time, uh, something that Ray was talking about. So it's just an, um, a suggestion from myself is have a look at Portland. OK, we, we, we are on the map. Bye. All right. Thank you very much, Paul. Did you want to come in, Laura, or just very, agree? very, very quickly? Um, thank you, um, Paul. That's really helpful. Um, I have been down there, but not since I have been in this role. So let's maybe set up a visit to pop over because I would be interested in, in coming over and just just thank you for the support, really. Thank you very much. Um, we have Councillor David Taylor next. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, team. Very, very interesting debate about uh, the centre itself. Um, it's the business model I'd be very interested in looking at because the fact is that I can't see it. And that's why I can understand Paul Kimber, Councillor Paul Kimber saying about Portland because I learned to dive there. And it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting place. But I just wondering what the business model is that we are helping with to actually make them go future wise because I wonder whether or not we're actually communicating a good business model to them to say this is the way forward for you. After all, we are considering <laughs> pushing in five hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year, which is an enormous amount of money for something that's uh, that's just just a third of our budget. So that would be my question as a businessman myself in the past. You know, I'd just be like to see the business model to see what are we doing about it. Thank you, but I I think that anybody coming through will be creating their own business plan. And this is yep. why if you have a community led group, community knows community and perhaps sometimes the council isn't the best organisation to drive a commercially viable product forward. Um, did you want to come in, Laura? Uh, just to say, I'm, I'm, I'm thank, thank you, um, Councillor Taylor. I'm not completely clear if, if we were to continue the £550,000 funding, then yeah, we would want to see a business model, but that's not what we're discussing. We're, we're discussing withdrawing that and, and it's the facility is not owned by us. So I think whilst we really want to support the owners of QE um, LC to to become sustainable, um, the chair is right. You know that that would be a decision for them because it would not be taxpayers money that we would be spending on a, a business plan. So we, we wouldn't necessarily need to see that. But there is something around best practice. There is something around the council being able to um, share expertise. Councillor Kimber's just um, made a good link. You know, absolutely, we can do those things, and that will be the activity of the two-year period. Can I come back on that, Chair? Yes, come back. Yeah. Uh, the fact is that the two-year plan you're looking at is 1.1 million pounds. And the fact is the taxpayer is going to say, say, why are we spending this money? What are we getting back for it? And that's what I'm concerned about is the fact that we have two years of opportunity to make sure that when the QE goes back into community hands, it actually is got a new model or a future. And that's what I think. That's what I think the problems are with all this discussion today is about where is it going? Thank you. That that's what the two year notice period is going to be for to drive that forward. And in fact, yeah. I think it would be really helpful, um, not just for this committee or, or who would do it. I, I'm not sure, but perhaps during the two year process, there are some feedback sessions on yeah. what's happening, how it's progressing just for members information. And, and so that we can disseminate that to the public as well. Would that be possible, Laura? Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, all the way through this, we've tried to keep everyone updated and um, what happens in the future, whether it is a community model that the owner would like to look at or, you know, whatever happens, um, we're 
committed to making the most of that two year spend to ensure that we use that time to leave um, the management of the facility to the owner in a sustainable position. So absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Taylor, do you really need yeah, to just to up? say that's that's the information we need because the fact is that we are going, we are advising for our communities. And the thing is that the questions will come from our communities about what are we doing? And that's it. That's a, that's the big question. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, I can actually see that Councillor Sherry Jesperson would like to come in now. Yes, just thank you, Madam Chairman, just to say that I think this has been a really, really excellent discussion. We we really drilled down into some detail and we've also um, covered the uh, strategic broad brush aspect of this. And I would like to thank everybody who's participating because this has been a, a, a really, really good meeting altogether. Um, if, what I was going to say is that we've given it a good, um, a good uh, discussion. So if everybody, if everybody's ready i'd like to to move to a vote and that if, if the way of doing that is to propose this um paper goes forward to cabinet i'd be very happy to do that thank you very much do i have a seconder val prosecree thank you very much okay we have a recommendation of four points i won't reason read them all out they're they're on the agenda um in fact Perhaps we could just pull the agenda up so we can see them all on the screen. Thank you. Um, OK, we've had a, a recommendation that's been seconded. Um, is anybody against the recommendation? I am. OK, thank you. Do we have any other dissenters? Sorry, Chairman Lindsay, Democratic Services here. Can I just for the purpose of the minutes just clarify who what that was that was against? Yeah. Councillor Maria Rowe is against the moving the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is nobody else dissenting, so that is moved and carried from this committee. So can I please ask uh, for John Selgren to come in and uh, for the minded two recommendation? Thank you, Chairman. And um, so I've read the report and I've uh, heard all of the dis discussions taking place in the committee this morning. Um, and therefore, I will take forward uh, those recommendations under delegation for that report to be prepared uh, for Cabinet uh, next month. Um, and if I'm, I'm, that's in a sense the formal bit, Chairman, but of course, uh, uh, Councillor Miller is the portfolio holder for this matter, who will be taking that report uh, to Cabinet, uh, has obviously been present throughout the whole discussion. So I think that's also been helpful. I'm, I know that she'll be uh, reflecting on the on the comments being made. And I would just, as an officer uh, uh, on, on your collective behalf and certainly on our behalf as officers, uh, underscore the, the point made just by Councillor Jesperson around um, the uh, the level of, of input and thought that's gone into this, which I'm sure both the officers will reflect on and, and we will with Councillor Miller as, as this uh, important matter is, uh, comes before Cabinet. Thank you very much. We gave that a good airing. Right, I'm going to move on now to item number nine, which is the uh, our overview committee forward plan. Um, just to note that we do have an additional meeting on the 7th of March at 10 o'clock. This is just to deal with the antisocial behaviour public spaces protection order that was due to come on today's uh, meeting, but uh, that there were a few issues it's just been put back. So that's an additional meeting for everybody. Um, would anybody like to come in and say anything on this or are we quite happy? No, quite happy. Thank you very much. Um, item 10, urgent items. I don't think there are any. And item 11, exempt business. We have no exempt business. So with that, I thank everybody for their input. It's been a good meeting. Everybody's had a good say. So thank you very much. And I close the meeting. <laughs>